Good evening, everyone, and warm welcome to all of you who are part of this conversation tonight. Uh, my name is Valentina Riccardi, and I'm heading the Cultural Department at the Asia Europe Foundation, ASEF. I'm delighted to welcome you to this culminating event of the series Recalibrating the Compass, What Future for Asia-Europe Cultural Relations. A few small housekeeping matters before we start. Uh, you will be able to uh, input your questions in the live chat box, and then you will also be able to ask anything or share anything through the same chat box. We are also uh, streaming on YouTube, so if you're not able to join on Zoom, uh, you may have received also uh, the YouTube link or probably you've seen it on our social media channels. Before we dig into the discussion, I would like to invite ASEF Executive Director, Ambassador Morikawa, to say a few words um, before to open the floor and welcome you here. Ambassador Morikawa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. The greetings from the Asia Europe Foundation, ASEF. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's public forum titled Asia Europe Cultural Relations A Look Ahead. This conversation is the final and culminating event of the consultation process initiated by ASF Culture Depo Department in May last year in celebration of ASF 25th anniversary. Through a series of five round tables, we have discussed with more than 60 experts in the field on the most pressing issues for Asia-Europe cultural relations and what role organizations such as ASEF can play. In this time of great geopolitical unrest and post-pandemic recovery. Tonight, with the help of our six esteemed speakers from the arts and the cultural sectors of the two regions, we will take a step forward and look ahead at what the future looks like and what we can do to improve it and contribute to it. I hope this conversation will inspire you to create new connections and develop new projects in the spirit of new and more meaningful cultural relations. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much to Ambassador Morikawa for these welcome remarks. And uh, once again, welcome to everyone. Uh, before going into presenting our speakers for tonight, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a context for this conversation this evening. As you probably know, we've started in 2022 um, on the occasion of ASEF's 25th anniversary and following the global pandemic and uh, the, the sort of relaunch from that, we decided to launch this series of conversation uh, entitled Recalibrating the Compass. And the idea was to examine current challenges and identify ways to develop new, more relevant and resilient forms of support for Asia-Europe cultural cooperation. We invited 60 speakers from our partners, stakeholders, from a variety of backgrounds, independent artists, arts organization, networks, governments, public institutions, to take part in these round tables. And what emerged from it is that uh, the consultation revealed several challenges that the cultural sector and the development of relation is facing. Uh, the more important thing was the fact that inequalities within the cultural sector were already present before, but they were exacerbated and accelerated by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, among others, the increased digital divide for professionals in the arts, the lack of access to training opportunities and networking, restrictions to cultural mobility, the impact of the climate crisis on the cultural sector, and also issues related to fair and sustainable practices. Um, some of the topics that we discussed in the Roundtable series. So on the other hand, several calls for change have emerged in the last months uh, from many institutional platforms. Uh, the consensus being that cultural relations should realign to global agendas, such as the UN 2030 Agenda for the Sustainable Development Goals, 
and the recent Mandia cult Declaration on Culture, which reaffirmed the transformative impact of culture for sustainable development and the real need to add culture as a goal. So what we're going to ask tonight to our speakers is to really look at the context in which we are now, as, as Ambassador Morikawa was saying, also geopolitically very uncertain and very unstable, and to really understand in which way we can navigate this complex geopolitical environment and continue to develop healthy and diverse cultural relations. So with this context in mind, we have invited tonight uh, six speakers from Asia and Europe, which I want to introduce to you briefly before I start to uh, give the floor to them. So uh, the first one on my screen <laughs> on top is Jordi Balta, and I start with Jordi because Jordi was also involved in the entire process of consultation with us. Uh, is a freelance consultant and trainer in the areas of cultural policy and international affairs with a particular interest in the role of culture in sustainable development. Jordi is connecting from Barcelona tonight. Thank you, Jordi, and welcome to this conversation. We have also Johan Flock uh, from On The Move. Uh, Johan has worked in independent arts organization and cultural institution, coordinating and contributing to many European uh, cooperation projects and pilot international collaborations. He's been an external expert for government bodies and private foundation, and he's now representing the director of operation of On The Move and manages also FACE, a resource platform that facilitates European capacity building programs in the contemporary performing arts field. He's also connecting from Europe. Good morning to you, Johan. We then have Ben, Benjamin Hampe. Good evening, Ben, from Singapore. Uh, ben is working as the project director of Connect ASEAN, a project developed by the ASEAN Foundation, one of the flagship programs of the ASEAN Foundation. He has 16 years of experience as a consultant, as a serve in leadership roles for private museum, art fair, and commercial galleries. Hi, Ben. Uh, moving on to Jasmine, Jasmine Ostendorf Rodriguez. I have to say, Jasmine, thank you very much because Jasmine is connecting from Mexico. So for her, this is really the middle of the night. So extra thank you to you for waking up in the middle of the night and connecting with us. Uh, Jasmine it works as a writer, curator and researcher on art and ecology. And she founded and runs the Green Art Lab Alliance Gala since 2012, a network of 50 arts organization in Europe, Latin America, and Asia that is in pursuit of fostering relationships that contribute to social and environmental justice. Hello, Jasmine. Moving on to Kamini. Kamini, hello. Uh, Kamini is based in Singapore. She's a pioneer in the field of oral storytelling in Asia, and through her network, Moon Shadow Stories, she's known for spearheading storytelling for adult audiences. She founded the nonprofit organization, the Storytelling Center Limited, to advance the art of storytelling through the Young Storytellers Mentorship Program. And finally, uh, we have Kathy, Kathy Rowland, also based in Singapore. And good evening to you, Kathy. Kathy, as many of you know, has been working in the arts for a long time, uh, running arts and cultural program and arts media platform. She's an independent editor, writer, researcher, and she's also the founder of Art Creator in Singapore, a site dedicated to supporting art and promoting arts criticism with a regional perspective on Southeast Asia. So with this very brief introduction, I want to move on now to our conversation for this evening. And I would like to start with Jordi, because again, as I mentioned, Jordi has a little bit of an insider view uh, on the whole consultation that we've worked on together. So maybe Jordi, to start, I would like to ask you uh, if you can maybe reflect on what are your ideas for revising cultural relations in light of the recent multiple crises that we have just briefly described. Yeah, thank you very much, Vali, and pleasure to, to share this session with uh, all of you, as it has also been a pleasure to accompany ASEF in the in this process of the uh, of the of the set of roundtables we've run 
in 2022. And as, as you were saying, I mean, I think the landscape we've seen is one in which uh, several challenges, very structural challenges overlap, how COVID-19 uh, has affected the health and well-being of communities and how it has shown the inequalities within societies, but also things like the uh, uh, very precarious working conditions of many in the cultural and creative sectors. And uh, in addition to that, I mean, we're, we're, we're also, of course, experiencing a, a very serious planetary crisis and other forms of um, gender and social inequalities in our uh, societies. Now, I would say um, uh, at the same time, we, we observed that these uh, challenges are very much shared across societies uh, because, I mean, with, uh, of course, with differences, there's many of these uh, factors that, that have a global uh, nature and which uh, find resonance uh, across societies. So I would say what the what the round tables have shown us and what we can observe more broadly in our societies is somehow uh, a set of contradictory session uh, pressures on the one hand for uh, some societies increasingly uh, or some groups within societies increasingly uh, focusing inwards and somehow tending to reject uh, exchange and giving precedence to uh, domestic affairs. And at the same time, there, there, there can be a space for uh, revising international collaboration in a way that serves also to address those inequalities and those weaknesses which are structural and which need, we need to address together. So um, I would say in, in terms of how we could revise cultural relations in the face of this, I think there is a potential and, and a, an important responsibility for networks, platforms, regional and international organizations and actors like uh, ASEF to uh, help favor and develop uh, new ways or new forms of cultural uh, collaborations that are more balanced, more aware of the social, economic, environmental and broader cultural aspects that are at stake in this context. And that, of course, uh, implies favoring more fair and, and more balanced and more equal uh, cultural relations that uh, give precedence to those uh, countries and those groups that might be in, in, in more difficult situations or that, let's say, are, are aware of those, uh, of those imbalances and that at the same time, take into account the responsibility of cultural and creative sectors with regard to broader social, economic and, and environmental uh, issues in their societies. And at the same time, I think it's also worth saying that, um, let's say, a lot of the things that we've been discussing in the set of roundtables have echoes in a number of initiatives which in recent years have addressed the need to develop more fair uh, international cultural collaboration, new forms of cultural diplomacy, and so on and so forth. So I think it's important to also build on the knowledge that exists. I think we have the knowledge and it's more a matter of putting that into action and of course having the, the necessary resources to do that, but also joining forces with a number of other stakeholders that have more or less the same uh, the same views and the same the same principles. Thank you, Jordi. Uh, maybe I will ask the same question to Ben, because uh, I feel that Ben has also a lot of experience within the context of ASEAN in terms of project that you've done uh, multilaterally. So this is also something that I'm sure you have some ideas about you want to tell us. Um, yeah, I, I actually, just leaping off um, from what Geordie has discussed, I think fairness uh, in the Asia-Europe context is really important for us to talk about. I mean, I represent the ASEAN Foundation, and most of the countries uh, that are represented by ASEAN are developing nations, um, bar Singapore and Brunei. And I, I think, well, we're where ASEF or the Asia Europe Foundation is situated, I think, uh, you know, leveling the divide and, and kind of actually realizing this fairness is actually very, very important. I think it must be at the crux of what your, your work uh, has to be in the future for you to be sustainable. Um, and that, that, anyway, this was something that just came to mind from, from Jordi's uh, um, introduction. Um, uh, I mean, 
look, we're, we're all uh, advocates here for our own work. I mean, we all understand that arts and cultural activities connect people and institutions, and uh, we, we know the importance of, of what we do, but actually the importance of what we do right now is not a given. And we really need to remind people uh, why our work is important. That, that this is actually so crucial uh, right now in this kind of the world in which we're living. I mean, so that a lot of uh, tra you know a lot of uh, oxygen is being absorbed by the multiple crises, crises rather that we're, that we're facing. Um, you know, we're, our region especially is still reeling from the pandemic, it, even. Uh, within the ASEAN context, all of our plans are based on COVID recovery. Uh, so, uh, I, I guess what, what, one I actually uh, Jordi also mentioned cultural diplomacy, and I, I think uh, during the um, the, the uh, research uh, process, I was part of the cultural diplomacy discussion. I think I think I may have brought up this kind of the cultural diplomacy is still a bugbear in our industry. It's so, something that we don't like to own. We try to you know, we 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 angst over it, and, and you know, try and separate it from cultural relations. Okay, try and try to find divides. And I think we need to retake it. I think this idea of cultural diplomacy must be uh, something that we need to own. I mean, we we can't always feel like we're being instrumentalized. You know, we we I mean, it needs to go both ways. Everyone needs to use each other as a tool. Uh, you know, to get through this. I, I don't think we can. Uh, we can't start. You know building up walls and divides within that with you know with, with our own patch of uh, patch of grass um i'll just finish off by saying i think multilateralism is so important i mean of course i'm an ASEANist, so I, of course i'll say that but i think uh, i mean the binary of bilateral relations is is what we are suffering from right now i mean we're, we're we are in the middle of a trade war between uh, the us and china we are now talking about great power conflict again it's like you know, a, a replay of the Cold War. I mean, uh, we we need to go. You know, we need to go back to those solidarity movements. We need we need to understand uh, what 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 in that post-colonial period of the 20th century, what brought all those countries together to reimagine what it meant to be to be you know, uh, you know a, a United Nations or a uh, or a you know a, a, or a, a regional organization such as ASEAN. I mean, I think some countries are starting to look at this idea of regionalism intentionally. There are new uh, organizations starting to arise. And, and again, uh, this is something that ASEF, I think, um, that should be a part of and should be, be, be very aware of. I mean, you have diplomats working within your organization, so you're, you're at the forefront uh, anyway. So anyway, I think I may have spoken for more than three minutes, so I'll stop. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for, thanks for throwing in all this ideas which I think also resonate with what Jordi was saying and I agree with you that we cannot polarize things and we cannot go into our own shelter but we should really just because now it's such a difficult time tap on to this relationship and uh, this multilaterality aspect as well. Uh, the other speakers tonight are more maybe working really on a practical level as well uh, in terms of relationships, in terms of building relationships in the cultural sector. So I wanted to ask them maybe a slightly different question, and I wanted to start maybe with Johan, um, looking at cultural relations from more practical perspective. Uh, I wanted to know if, uh, if there's anything that you would do differently or better in order to develop a more inclusive and fair uh, cultural relations, which is something that also came across in our conversation and also we were talking about now. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you for, for the kind invitation and to be contributing to this conversation. In a way, we are building up on, on what uh, was said just now. Um, on the movie is really dedicated to circulating, but also creating knowledge about international relations and, and international cultural mobility. So when I hear Jordi talking about uh, the aspect of knowledge that we have and that we need to continue to grow, I think it resonated a lot with the pragmatic approach that we have. Um, for us, what uh, we do better now actually is to collect data to collect information and to be able to um, um, uh, study uh, the mobility flows to establish the facts and figures that will serve for 
you know, advocating for fairer and more inclusive cultural relations. Last year, in 2022, we started a new publication called the Cultural Mobility Yearbook. And this, in this publication, we analyze the 700, 800 international mobility calls that we signpost every year. And to analyze these uh, mobility opportunities were for us a great opportunity to actually establish, you know, the very important facts about how mobility is today in the, in the pandemic era, in the post-pandemic era, uh, and to really delve into sustainability issues, greener mobility uh, issues, digital or virtual mobility, access, inclusion. So I guess for us, um, when we started this process of uh, developing this annual yearbook, we wanted to create a reference frame framework to be able to uh, compare the data from one year to the next, to revisit these data in relation to world regions, to disciplines, to mobility formats, and really to investigate uh, the realities and make sure that all the facts and figures, in a way, serve for um, um, the artistic communities, but also, also uh, um, you know, states, uh, to be able to see where were the weaknesses or the challenges. Um, when we do this kind of, um, of uh, analysis, we see very clearly the, you know, limitations that are met by the field uh, when we try to change the paradigm and to build fairer and more inclusive uh, international relations. And of course, On The Movie is very committed, as you all know, to continue to provide such valuable overview uh, that can be useful to make strategic decisions and to make policy decisions. This year, I mean, literally in a couple of weeks, we will be publishing the 2023 uh, Cultural Mobility Yearbook with a very strong focus on international, on environmental, sorry, sustainability. And um, what we can see, what I can share with you already, is that the, the weight of this theme in all the mobility opportunities is very big. And we can see that this theme uh, is broadly you know, investigated by festivals, by artists and in residence programs. Uh, many operators in the culture field at global level try to embrace and investigate these climate emergency. And at the same time, we can see that funders, public institutions, states, private foundations have trouble to accompany this movement. So there is a discrepancy. So um, it's always useful to have this kind of tool that are very practical to be able to quantify and to qualify and support the field to continue to grow in these uh, in establishing good standards. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. I mean, I totally agree with you. The fact that data also is generally, you know, we collect a lot of data, but who's analyzing this data is always a little bit problematic. So something like this, this initiative, I think it's extremely important to really understand what the trends are based on real data and also how we can adapt to that. The other point you made about the fact that there's a discrepancy between what is done on the ground and what maybe uh, institution governments are doing is also something to keep in mind, I, I'm sure, and uh, where we can also play maybe an advocacy, more strong advocacy role. Uh, I wanted to move to Cathy. Uh, Cathy, for you, looking also at this uh, more practical approach, I know that with the Arts Equator you work in the region, Southeast Asia, but also Asia more in general. What, what has been your experience and what kind of uh, approaches you, you've kind of worked on or your experience in this sense in terms of better relations, more fair approach to cultural relations? Yeah, thanks, Valentina. And, uh... Thanks for inviting us. I, I think I want to just kind of echo what Benjamin was saying about, you know, regionality, because I'm also kind of very much about the region. Um, but then they are also embedded within the region kind of power relations and sensitivities that um, if, you know, for example, we are Singapore based, but then we're outward looking into Southeast Asia. And with that comes a particular kind of perception about imbalances of power, because in the end, it's about where the money comes from. Right. Um, 
And so just to maybe to answer your question, I'll just give you a little bit about background about arts equator. We set up six years ago because we felt that there was a gap in the arts ecosystem. What we observed was across the region, of course, in different you know, levels, there was a development and growth in terms of the number of artists that were making work, the experimentation and the quality and the, the quantity of work that was being produced. There was also growing um, kind of arts infrastructure, more funding opportunities, more spaces that was coming. Some of this comes out of, is influenced very much by the kind of creative industries discourse, which is, you know, which is problematic, but the net effect was that there was just a lot more stuff that was happening in the region. But at the same time, what we also observed was that there was a downward, quite a sharp decline in the kind of spaces that was discussing the work. So newspapers, media or outlets were cutting back on their reviews and their criticism, unless it was lifestyle and could be kind of, you know, commercialized to, to, some, to some extent, and I'm not anti-commercial, um, you know, it really, there was just no more space. So we, we then decided that, okay, you know, this was what we would do. And we spent the next six years creating kind of critical content, um, creating reviews, uh, critical essays, podcast, um, opinion pieces, timelines of, of um, cultural controversies. For example, we've done quite a lot about the documenta issue from a Southeast Asian, Asian perspective when overwhelmingly the writing has been, has come from a European kind of, you know, first world perspective, let's say. So we did that and I think it was quite valued, um, but it was an editorial model that was very much centered in Singapore with us kind of saying to our regional writers, can you write about this? Can you write about that, you know? Um, and then we did a survey, we did a reader survey, a stakeholder survey last year, supported by Spice Media organizations. So I just want to give a shout out to Spice Media. And what we found was that our stakeholders really appreciated what we did, but different stakeholders wanted different things from us. And sometimes the wants of our stakeholders were diametrically in opposition to each other. And so we found, we realized that we were doing what a lot of arts organizations do, which is you want to do everything you want to do it for everyone and you want to do it with very little money. Um, and okay, so that, you know, but it also revealed a structural issue and the structural issue is that the way that we were structured was that, you know, our stakeholders had to come to us and we, had, the onus was then on us to make things happen for them. Um, and so it made us kind of rethink a little bit our editorial model, right? One that was really central in centralized in Singapore where the decision-making and a lot of times our imagined reader was regional, but also it was, you know, very, it, I think it was biased towards, let's say a particular kind of cosmopolitan reader. Um, and so, you know, we're in the middle now of transforming the organization to, to I think, change that kind of structural, what we see as a structural kind of, you know, um, imbalance. Um, and what we're trying to do is to pivot from being publishers and commissioners and distributors of content, critical content, to actually creating um, funding and platforms. So creating grants for writers in, um, in Makassa, in Isabella, in Chiang Mai, in Ipoh, to write content to be paid for and to write content that or to create content that's relevant to their arts community in a language that their arts community wants to read it in and in a format that their arts community wants to experience it in. Um, yeah, so so it's we're still early days. We're about we're hoping to launch the pilot in about three or four months time. Um, but we think that it will be one way to kind of change the structures of, you know, who gets to say what about the arts. Um, yeah, and, and we're, we're quite excited, uh, you know, to launch it and, of course, make all the mistakes that you can possibly make. Thanks, Cathy. No, this is really exciting. And thanks for sharing the whole sort of move and process of shift between your initial model and, and this. I, I completely understand because we, as you know, we have Culture360, which is also a big platform where we try to really give everything we can to all the communities out there and sometimes it is an issue uh, and sometimes it is better to be a little bit more focused but I also completely agree with you that giving grants to people who are less in the position of even reaching those grants in areas that are less visible that are less 
um, part of this whole conversation. It's absolutely fundamental and a lot of interesting things I'm, so, I'm sure will come out of it. Um, moving on to Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine, as I mentioned before, she, she started this great project of gala uh, in 2012, and we were also very fortunate to be uh, sort of involved in that initial phase, and we are actually members of GALA. So I wanted to ask her from her perspective um, of running uh, this network and being part of this network, which is really a global network, uh, how do you see uh, and what ways uh, can you share in terms of how to build better cultural relations? Yeah, thank you so much. And also thank you for bringing us all together, Asif, because this is really valuable to hear. And I've just been nodding my head like crazy listening to Johan and Kathy going like, yes, yes, I recognize so much um, of what everyone's saying. Um, with the Alliance, you know, we're working in a lot of different geographies, not only in terms of countries, but also well, obviously in cultures, but also some Organizations are based in very rural areas, you know, very remote and some in cities. So you could imagine like the differences uh, between the, the realities vary enorm enormously. Um, so it's kind of what, what's coming back, I think for me really on a, on a daily basis is this question of how we actually also have a different understanding of all the different terminologies that we are using. We're using the same words, but we mean different things or we, we understand it in different things just because we are coming from a different position. So when we're talking about uh, the word inclusive, for instance, it's like inclusive for whom? And who is, who is asking? <laughs> Um, and the question of we, who is we? The question of fairness, fairness for whom and fairness for what? And the same with sustainability. Is sustainability about our planet or is it about the well being, our personal well being? Is it about our organization? Is it about our finances? And we can really, I think, well, my experience is that we cannot make an assumption that we all have the same understanding of. of uh, those terms. And then on top of that, of course, there is, you know, the, the dominance of the English language um, and what that means for inclusivity, because, you know, that also means a lot of people cannot uh, participate in that dialogue. Um, in terms of the Alliance, I think uh, a lot of our work is obviously around climate justice and then the word, you know, climate also couldn't be more different to some extent, you know, because also our, our climate realities uh, vary enormously. Um, and I think often, or often, I mean, it happens that, that it becomes uh, a lot about what we can and can't do. So it's about, oh no, but we, we can't fly or you can't do this. And it just becomes very clear working with such a diversity of organizations and practitioners that there is no, there is no one size fits all. <laughs> there is no one solution fits all. And so to my interpretation of, of FAIR is really starting from what is the reality of, of that practitioner. So in terms of uh, what is the political context, what is your environmental context, what's your economical context, what is your social context? Because you know, in some countries, yes, there, there is governmental funding or there are trains so you don't have to fly or there is a recycling system, the infrastructure is there, um, but that is not the case for everyone. So when you can start from the point of, okay, there is these different realities, but then actually, our values are aligned. And so something that's been really useful for us because it's, yeah, as, as a group is, is this, uh, is like a collaborative writing exercise on, on writing a manifesto. So then you really see like, uh, okay, so maybe we don't want to accept any funding from fossil fuel or mining companies, for instance, but what does that mean in 
a different context or we only want to uh, you know every, every organization serves only vegan food okay but what does that mean in <laughs> this other country so this collaborative writing has been really interesting seeing okay if you write a manifesto where can we find each other and then that's actually been like an incredible sounding board for our conversations about where where our values align even though our realities differ thank you that yeah it's it's great what you're talking about because it's again i think very real in the work that we do and the fact that you know we talk about inclusion but then also in terms of terms what do we mean coming from different countries completely different ways of understanding that so yeah thanks a lot for for you these words i just want to now go to kamini because kamini from your point of view as an artist but also an educator and then using this powerful uh, tool of storytelling uh, i think you must have experienced a lot and you i'm sure you have also look at this big topic for cultural relations from a very real and very human to human uh, connection point of view absolutely valentina um thank you to asia europe foundation for getting all of us together to talk about this you're right, it all starts with communication and communication in itself can be problematic when you talk about who gets to communicate, who gets to tell their story, the danger of the one story, how the story is communicated, and then who are the listeners or the witnesses, right, to this communication. But more importantly, to zero in on the question that you asked, right, you know, how can we be more inclusive and fairer thinking about cultural relations? And what would I do differently or what can be better developed? So I want to share more from a practitioner's point of view and what is actually happening on the ground and what um, artists and practitioners are trying to do because we always find ourselves in the situation where policymakers, stakeholders, funding agencies put us in. And then so we try to adapt and adopt good practices that can trickle down, especially to emerging artists and to people that we are mentoring and teaching and training. So being involved in you know, numerous global collaborative projects, especially in the last three years, I've become really aware of how participants can be very isolated due to the inequalities of language, like Yasmin just spoke about. So language comprehension or language familiarity in, is in itself problematic and it is not equal when people, two people or more people speak. But I found that being multilingual myself, growing up in this Southeast Asian region, has been an incredible asset for me, not just as an artist, but very much in my role as a mentor and teaching artist. So I've begun to use multiple languages especially online, right? Where you don't get to read the nonverbal cues, where everything is reliant on the small video and a lot can be missed. And I think that was one big step to be able to train and teach and speak and coach in whatever language that I felt was going to be helpful at that moment and that time to really respond to the person on the other side. Some recent projects I've encouraged participants to also support each other in the group by them becoming translators or them stepping in to say that I can help and then to introduce translation tools and always making sure that there is additional time to discuss topics. So it takes a while for people to ease into communication and then when you give them that additional time, that's where the magic happens and that's where you can address all these gaps and inequalities. So being flexible and going in with a very creative mind that's not rigid has really, really helped. So these are very small steps, but I think what I want to impress upon is that they are respectful steps, right? Respectful steps that have provided a space so that we can have meaningful discussions where everybody is feeling heard. So this in turn will result in a more vibrant and a more active community of practice where everybody isn't holding back and they're all happy to share their thoughts and their voices. So that's what I'd like to share. Thanks, Kamini. Thanks. Yeah, this is so important. I think already a few of you have talked about the language barrier, which I think is, again, something that all of us have experienced and we should really think of because it's 
definitely something that creates that imbalance and that inequality. So if there are ways, as you described, Camille, to do that. And I like the idea also of the participant who also become facilitator, but maybe being the one who have that capacity to speak that different language. And so they play that role as well. That's also very powerful. Uh, maybe I'll just follow up uh, on this question with you, Kamini, because I also wanted to uh, ask all of you um, a little bit more of in your practice and in what you have seen, not only what you do, but what you've seen around you, uh, if you notice or if you have anything of interest to share in terms of new ways of doing things, because I think some of these things have already come up uh, in the first question, but maybe more specifically, if you can share something about that, maybe Kamini, you want to start? Thanks. Um, so I noticed a uh, a rise in peer organized programs. And these peer organized programs or events, they really support capability development and they encourage networking amongst us, right? Amongst the peers, this peer group of artists and cultural practitioners. I've also noticed more virtual platforms and more virtual opportunities that allow for global connections among us, again, among the artistic and creative communities. And what's been really obvious is the visibility of self-organized and artist-led collaborative projects. So it's almost like the last three years have allowed all of us to, to look at what we need and to think about specific themes and gaps that we would like address. And there's a kind of an urgent impatience, not wanting to wait for somebody else to figure this out. And so most of these initiatives really address what the group itself feels we need, what kind of attention we need now. So this responsive um, pattern is something that I've really observed. And some examples that I can think of that's very specific to kind of the work that I do is teaching artists around the world. You know, we have our own think tanks and ITAC, the International Teaching Artist Collective has been very supportive in helping us create these virtual connections around the world to share best practices and to support each other. And this has been going on really beautifully, virtually for the last two and a half years, for sure. And then there are also very informal artist groups that use social media to connect with people around the world. And these are very private groups that you stumble upon accidentally or someone recommends to you. And they're very much focused about turning up for each other and supporting each other and having taking baby steps so that it's not overwhelming. So I'm finding that these networks, even networks of international producers, right? Producers around the world getting together and thinking about what does it mean to be a producer in your country, in my country, and how can we produce across borders and collaboratively? All these seem to be new ways of doing where people are not waiting for someone else to organize a plan. Um, and I think it's good. I think it's really healthy and it's, it's what creatives do, right? We, we see a problem and we creatively address it and fix it. And find a solution for it. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Kamini. Yeah, this is really interesting. I think, Jasmine, probably similar experience, right? Maybe you can share also a little bit on this, if you have experienced yourself or seen any new ways of doing things. Definitely. Yeah, and again, <laughs> recognizing a lot of what's being said. Um, something that I see a lot, I guess also because, you know, we're, we're working in, in this domain of also the intersection with ecology and the arts, sustainability in the, in the cultural sector. Uh, but there's been a lot of interest in like nature-based solutions um, in a lot of different ways. So... One thing is, for instance, in terms of materials. So artists really wanting to work with more environmentally friendly materials, you know, non-toxic or biodegradable. Um, one of the things that we have developed as an alliance with our, with our partner, Jan van Eyck Academy in the Netherlands, is a platform called the Future Materials Bank, which is an online database to e exchange knowledge and information on, on alternatives uh, for uh, for sustainable materials for artists, um, but then not only in terms of materiality, but also in ways of thinking. 
So something that I've been very interested in personally is looking at biomimicry, uh, particularly of system design. So what are the, the ecosystems that can inform us on how we can you know, design better alternatives uh, in our ways of work and in collaborating. And something that I've been, I found highly inspirational, uh, which might <laughs> seem as a surprise for people, is uh, the mycelium, which is the underground network of the fungus. So it's also called a wood wide web. Uh, that's how some people know it. So it's like an, an, a communication system underneath the ground, how how fungi and, and plants and, and trees can redistribute resources, uh, exchange information, um, be decentralized. And as an alliance, you know, there are so many similarities actually in our, in our ways of working uh, that are really inspirational. Uh, actually, for the last two years, I've been working on a book called Let's Become Fungal taking like the teachings of the world of fungi and how we can implement these teachings in our ways of working, how, you know, how to be mutually beneficial like fungi are, how to be decentralized like the mycelium is. And initially it seemed like it just has like a profound usefulness as metaphor, but then actually there are some very concrete teachings also uh, to take from that. Um, so yeah, you see, I think, you see that for a lot of people, there's an interest in biomimicry. A lot of the, the solutions or the, 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 the ideas are already you know, in this world. We just need to look and observe in a different way for that knowledge to come to us. We have to listen. We have to listen more carefully. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating, really. I, I want to learn more about it because it's something that I was reading about when uh, we started talking. I knew you were doing this research, but the fact that, as you said, it's not just as a, as a sort of idea there, but really like to translate that in the work that we do, it's, it's amazing. And there's so many new things we can learn from it. Uh, thanks, Jasmine. Ben, I think your experience is a little bit different, but maybe you have also some interesting things to share. It's funny you bring up my solution because we did a, a, a conference at the end of last year with the Nanyang Technological University um, Center for Contemporary Arts, and we had a keynote speaker, uh, Cynthia Ong from Forever Saba. And uh, this, this may, maybe feeds a little bit back into what I was speaking about before about connecting, you know, advocacy uh, groups that aren't particularly strictly with the arts. So she's actually an environmental activist. So uh, we we brought her in, and and I'd just been watching this Netflix special on mycelium and fungus. And my partner's a, a pharmacist, so I, I got really into this idea. And then she brought it up at the conference, and and I think it really feeds into this idea of multilateralism and regionalism and, and connecting because. I mean that the and the idea of this network that that is the lifeblood that supports everyone. It, you know that you have mother trees and and all of the little mushrooms connecting everyone and and, and passing energy to each other. I I love that idea so much. And I, in fact, when Cynthia brought it up, I could I, you know I I just you know kind of exploded and started <laughs> talking about this Netflix special I just watched. So I, I mean uh, yeah. I, Look, uh, I think um, finding these connections with with, with other um, uh, with other uh, sectors, uh, I mean, is really really important for for our survival, uh, you know, in general, and not just um, well, not just us as people, but for uh, for the arts and cultural sector. Uh, I think during, I mean, just going back to the original question about um, things that I noticed. I mean, during the pandemic, I mean, even our program could not function. <laughs> I mean, there was no. I mean, the, I mean, luckily, uh, uh, Valentina uh, and I got got to talking, uh, uh, you know, and and managed to get a virtual program up and running. And this was happening quite a lot. And I mean, it, it was a problem not just experienced. It was experienced by everyone, of course, even institutions and programs that they they, they had completely broken down. And I think um, that those new ways of working that we discovered, I think they they you know, they, they go on. I mean, the, uh, we, the, the conversations continue and we find, find new ways of working. So anyway. Yeah, I, I think in a way from what you're saying is 
it's definitely true that the these three years of pandemic some learnings we we really have from that and we still continue to 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 implement those format and use those opportunities that were necessity before and that now maybe they're not a necessity anymore but they're still really helping us in developing connections. Uh, Cathy, what about you? What what can you share in terms of new ways of doing from your point of view of Arts Equator, but also from what you've noticed and observed around you, also in the region? Yeah, um, it's also kind of pandemic inspired, but nowhere near as charming, you know, as fungi and <laughs> mycelium, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so one of the things that, you know, that came out of the roundtable that ASAP did was this idea of, you know, that arts organizations, generally kind of an artist, had a lot of progressive, were quite progressive, and they had a lot of, um, they had a lot of cultural capital and could push governments and other organizations to, for example, um, take on progressive uh, causes, whether it's the climate and so on. But the one thing that I've noticed, I mean, I've noticed lots of things that everyone's saying here really, you know, kind of resonates with me. But one thing that I maybe wanted to share was that I'm also noticing that there's a turning inwards and a kind of shining the light back on the industry, an industry that sees itself as, you know, as progressive, as, as equitable. Uh, what I've observed is that there seems to be, there, there have been kind of pockets of, of artists, art workers along the whole kind of ecosystem who are questioning, challenging the way that the arts industry itself works, the kinds of practices, whether they are labor practices, um, whether it's about self-care, it's about sexual harassment or other kinds of abuse that really have been quite prevalent within our own community. Um, and it's striking that people, young people now are, well, not just young people, but people are willing to talk about it. And, um, and I think partly that's been inspired by the Me Too movement, but it's also come about because artists were really confronted by how precarious their livelihoods and their, their whole being was when the pandemic hit. Um, so, you know, it really is, it is true that while artists kind of we pride ourselves as being kind of forward looking and non-conforming and hyper aware, as someone who's worked in the arts for, you know, kind of 30 years, it is shocking. It is shocking how hierarchical it can be, how patriarchal it can be, um, you know, and, and often it's under the guise of, you know, well, if you're passionate and if you believe in the arts and you do this, then, you know, you, so young people entering the arts sector kind of face this kinds of, you know, romanticism, right? You know, uh, it's okay, you know, you will be paid much less, but, you know, you will work much longer hours and there will be very little health and safety precautions and safety nets for you, but, you know, you're an artist, you know. Um, so I think these have been quite daunting. I think these daunting working conditions of long kind of hours, little pay, um, you know, kind of dangers and physical and emotional, mental kinds of dangers that they've had to face. Uh, I like to say that, you know, a lot of arts workers, myself included, we're kind of like, um, we're really glamorous blue collar workers. Because if you look at the, the ratio of our pay versus our educational um, kind of background versus the number of hours that we work, uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's incre I remember reading an article about that, that said that um, New York, so a New York publishing executive with an MFA earns less than a postal worker in Philadelphia, right? Um, yeah, and so what I've, so I wanted to kind of highlight three small initiatives that I've observed uh, in the region, two of which are in Singapore and one in Indonesia. Um, one is called Citrus Practice, which is Singapore-based. The other is called Good Practices in Singapore Theatre. And then the third is Shifting Realities in Indonesia. And these are all kind of initiatives rather than organizations, the groups of people that have come together to address issues of self-care, to address issues of income inequality within the art sector, right? I mean, you know, in Singapore, in some parts of, of well, in, in the two, two areas I know well, Malaysia and Singapore, this is definitely a working class versus, you know, kind of, you know, um, you know, middle class, upper middle class divide between, for example, the crew that works on a theater production, you know, and the people that are on stage. 
Um, yeah, so, so, you know, I, and I think that maybe we need to really kind of support these kinds of emerging themes and concerns in any way that we can, those of us that have been around longer or those of us that are in positions of, of power, institutional power, uh, you know, kind of cap, they have got more cultural capital, that's it, in some of these young groups, because, of course, they, they're putting themselves in a slightly awkward position, you're, you're entering this, you're entering this, the sector, you want to build your career, but at the same time, you're critiquing the practices of the sector, right? Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I think, you know, for me, if we can, we can address these, these gaps and inequalities and hierarchies within the sector itself, it not only are we modeling behavior for the people that we're trying for this, for the societies that we're trying to change, but I think it makes the arts organizations also more resilient. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think we are all in the same sort of situation. And this fact that, you know, it's a sector that is so informally uh, structured also, it's one of the reason why things are so, you know, less clear and, and in a way this romanticizing of it, it's all true. I mean, we are all working more than we would like to, but then at the same time we do great jobs, so it's fine. So it's great that, you know, you, you kind of notice uh, these new trends that are happening within the sector and then of also of young people who are coming in and maybe the pandemic also helped in that because after that crisis time now people are more vocal and more ready to just say you know I work in this sector but I also want to work in a better way if you want. So maybe moving on to Johan, uh, Johan what is your experience, what can you share in terms of new ways of doing I mean, I, I'm very inspired and I have to say I echo um, I, uh, everything that I hear so far really resonate with our own experience and my own experience as a researcher also investigating, you know, working conditions of uh, artists, uh, accessibility uh, for disabled artists and disabled cultural workers. I mean, everything you say, Kathy, but also Kamini are really resonating a lot. What I see is because of this level of awareness or this knowledge, uh, this visibility of all the issues, even in our own cultural field, I see that we all try to navigate paradoxes constantly. And this is our big work, our big, I mean, the biggest trend probably, um, as um, Yasmin was saying, uh, values align and realities differs. And because of this, we are constantly trying to cope with uh, many different realities that are somehow antagonistic um, or feel like they are. But I want to say the uh, not everything is doom and gloom. Uh, and I really am optimistic, uh, not only by nature, but also because I can see that many civil society organizations, NGOs, cultural you know, networks uh, uh, at European uh, international level are really advocating for more, I mean, fairer practices and, and more inclusive uh, practices. And it feels like all these, uh, these voices are heard. And uh, at least in Europe, it feels like even the political level, you know, public institution, etc., align somehow with um, our own objectives and align with the values we are somehow defending. So I, I want also to put a, a positive note in this because it feels like, um, of course, we are more advanced and we feel sometimes we are more advanced than the political bodies and the, you know, funders, etc. Just to give you an example, we, I mean, as you know, in On The Move, we work on uh, cultural mobility funding guides. So we map, you know, funding sources to support the mobility of uh, artists and cultural workers. And we can see um, lately working on the Balkan region, on Africa and Northern Africa, that many funders and international funders have trouble to take into account environmental sustainability, have trouble to take into account, you know, specific circumstances, uh, like disability or to take it to account gender balance etc but still they they are aware and they try to develop new strategies and policies so i i want to you know i mean probably bring a, a positive aspect to this also because and and these are the examples that were given already by my colleagues uh, i feel that the field is very proactive in proposing standards and you know, updating uh, what are 
the good practices. And in many you know, aspects from gender-based violence to, I mean, accessibility or inclusion, I feel we are very good also at setting up standards, you know, and I can see that we are good also at implementing them, not just having the ideas, but actually adopting new ways to work. Um, maybe the next challenge will be how do we make sure we share all these responsibilities and it goes beyond us, beyond the cultural field? And how do we share responsibilities? Because I really believe that the artist, the individual cultural workers, the small grassroots cultural organization, they can, cannot take all the responsibilities. So we need to share these responsibilities. But um, yeah, I want to be positive. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Johan. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great to hear that, you know, there's there's also from the government level uh, an awareness on that and some action on that. And maybe this is something I also wanted to ask Jordi about because you, you I know you work more in the context also of UNESCO internationally. Uh, is this something you have also uh, observed that not only from the sector, there is, you know, a really strong uh, push to find new ways of working, but also so from government sector to sort of align with these new ways. Maybe you can share about that. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, I think, I think first of all, I mean, the range of experiences we, we're seeing, despite the difficulties that everyone is experiencing in their own context, shows that there's quite a lot of, of thinking and, and revising of, of our practices. And, and I would say to a certain extent, uh, that is also reflected in, in, in policies at, at different levels. Although, uh, as it has also been said, uh, often, let's say the, the pace of development is, is different and things uh, in certain contexts because of the nature might move more slowly, but hopefully uh, at some point there's, there's an alignment and, and, and I think there's, there's positive uh, trends in that, in that respect. Now, uh, also I wanted to, to share some, some of these emerging practices that I found inspiring uh, recently. And, and first of all, I mean, it, it's always, it's already been mentioned, but, um, I think in the context of the recalibrating the compass uh, set of roundtables that ASEF uh, organized uh, last year, as a European, I was particularly struck by many uh, experiences coming from Asia that are not always very visible, at least in our context, but which I found were very, very inspiring in terms of uh, local organizations working uh, with minority groups and, and with the uh, rural communities or with other forms of, of community groups, uh, organizations that are working to foster a freedom of artistic expression in very difficult uh, situations, uh, engaging in more sustainable and more ethical practices. And, and it, as, as it has already been said, I mean, it's of course, we, we always need to consider what's what's the meaning of sustainability in different contexts and I'm, I'm 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 referring both to the environmental implications but to a broader and more holistic understanding of sustainability that also integrates the social the cultural and the revision of the economic models that uh, that lie behind and i think julia earlier shared the link to the to the set of reports that have been produced from the recalibrating the compass and by the way thanks to julia because i'm just looking at the chat and, and the, the number of links she's been sharing, and it's quite impressive. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to checking lots of those uh, initiatives. Now, another experience that I, I wanted to, to share is I, I, I wrote a report for the European Dance House Network a, a few months ago on contemporary dance and, and environmental sustainability. And um, it, it, the report presented or helped us to identify several very interesting examples of how dance organizations are dealing with, uh, with environmental sustainability in their work. I mean, I don't know, I can think of organizations like the Duncan Dance Research Center in Athens that is integrating principles of permaculture in their, in their work and, let's say, developing uh, like uh, um, yeah, environmental work and agricultural work and, and educational activities in their in their surroundings. But also, I mean, from several of the people that we talked to, I mean, there were very interesting reflections on how thinking about more sustainable ways of working also implies challenging the traditional uh, models of production uh, in the contemporary in contemporary dance, but more broadly in the arts, which tend to be based on always 
uh, having to to develop new productions and and let's say that that obsession with the new which might need to be challenged and somehow uh, giving more space to educational work to community work to touring and presenting work that already exists and which is less depleting of resources and so on so i think that there were very interesting uh, um, reflections in that respect and in the report we also try to uh, present a set of uh, principles to be applied contextually, because I agree that the conditions can be very different depending on the social and political and economic context where you're operating. But basically the idea was to present a set of principles to be applied contextually on how to develop more environmentally sustainable mobility. And, and indeed taking into account a, a, a holistic range of, of, of factors. Um, and then, um, yeah, I would say also more locally uh, in, in Catalonia, where, where I'm based, uh, we've also been doing some work on, on the arts, health and, and well-being and looking at some interesting experiences in that respect. And then, I mean, among the different uh, examples that I found interesting uh, are that of, of museums that are developing more uh, welcoming spaces and spaces, let's say, which are meant particularly or initially thought for people with disabilities or people with particular health conditions, but which by becoming more welcoming for those uh, those groups of people end up being more welcoming for everyone because uh, all of us can somehow benefit from more uh, inclusive and welcoming spaces. And I'm thinking, for instance, of the Museum of Art in a town called Cerdanyola near Barcelona, but there's several others that are interesting as well. Thanks, Jordi. Thanks. Yeah, I think there's there's quite a few very interesting things out there that we can look at. But as you said, also some uh, points that came out from the roundtable discussion that uh, were really useful. And I think put in context is something that we can really act on. And this brings me to the last uh, part of our conversation. Uh, I think we have still 20 minutes, but I have one question that I want to ask you which is, of course, nearer to my heart because it's uh, also part of the work that we do at Azeth. As you can imagine, cultural relations, we started from the bigger picture. We, are we went into real uh, examples, practices of things that are happening, but there are organizations like ours that operate in this very big, uh, broad context. And we are really uh, very, very, um, uh, very much looking at ways to collaborate with others and ways in which we can improve because sometimes you look at organizations like ASEF, they've been around for 25 years, they're sort of funded by governments, there is sort of an institutional importance in, in the mission of the organization, but then we need to also be uh, realistic and adapt to the day-to-day -day life of, of the things that are happening and that are changing. And so this brings me to my question about what ASEF can do or what role you think ASEF can play. It could be that we already do it. I hope that you're, we already do some good things in, uh, in this area, but maybe there are some ideas or some other um, areas that you can suggest uh, where you think that we could play uh, a role as well, of course, in terms of, you know, uh, bringing uh, Asia and Europe nearer and creating a better cooperation uh, between these two regions and between the people working in the sector. So maybe asking this question about ASEF and what role you see ASEF playing, um, who wants to start? Uh, I don't know, maybe shall I ask Ben? I see he's moving towards the mic. <laughs> ben. I can help you, Valentina. Please. <laughs> um, because I've got because our organisation was in a similar situation. I mean, ASEAN actually just thought arts and cultural projects were too hard and didn't do them for like fifteen years until very, 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 very recently. Um, I mean, it seems like a lot of. Uh, of course, we work directly with governments, but we're not policy makers. And I assume that ASEF is in a similar position. So, I—I uh, I mean, uh, one, one thing that we are uh, we are working on at the end of our program is we we will do a report um, back to all of our stakeholders, including governments and our funders, and the, and th those reports will be full of recommendations. So, I've heard a lot of uh, talk about labour issues, fairness. I mean, uh, uh, ASEAN, of course. I mean, we don't have to just talk about ASEAN, but because, I mean, if we're talking across Europe and Asia, the, the norms are very, very different. But, I mean, you know, 
this is the difficulty, of course, when you when you're working with multilateral organizations. Or what is, you know, are, are we supposed to come up with a norm? Are we are we supposed to work with a norm? Do we work in particular ways with with other countries? But so I mean, this this is a conversation I think that is worth us having. Um, and you know, and we could come up with some kind of recommendations. And this could, I mean, this could turn into another project in and of itself. Um, uh, I mean, for, look, our program is very focused. Um, uh, we're, we're a visual arts program. We don't try and do everything, and we're not all things to everyone. It's impossible. Uh, but our organization is a public diplomacy organization, so they have other programs. They have gender um, uh, rights programs. They have. Uh, you know, uh, youth programs, they have educated. So, you know, the, we, 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 take, uh, we take something from those programs as well and integrate them into what we do. But I think you, I mean, at, at least for, for us, we, we needed something that was, you know, focused and we could do well. Otherwise, the, the, the programs aren't sustainable. They, they, they will happen once and then they, you know, that, they'll never happen again. Um, uh, yeah, I think, there we go. That's my suggestion for That's you, Tina. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Everything is recorded, so I don't have to read notes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, who, who wants to go next? Maybe, I don't know, Jasmine, would you like to? Yes, there we go. Um, yes, uh, well, I'm not completely objective, obviously, when I say this, but I, well, there's two things that I'm a big fan of that you, well, there's a, a lot of things that you do that I'm a big fan of, but two things in particular, um, obviously, are the, the guides, like the, the Creative Responses to Sustainability series that we started in 2015, I think, and it's been really amazing to see how that continued, and I still get emails today from people from all over the world saying, oh, I want to make a creative responses to sustainability guide and people using these Please mappings. Send them, send them to us. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So it's, it's, it's just been really great to see there has been such a, an interest in that. And then also I was really happy where I always hear a lot of good things about the Mobility First program, that it's really like, uh, easy let's say to to apply or it's it's uh, yeah it's it's very inclusive in that sense and yeah that's also because I'm still you know I come from the world of residencies and that's still something that I really believe in um, you know even though you know we have to cut down on our travel and, and the pandemic we couldn't but I really still believe somehow that proximity grows solidarity and in a like in an accelerated form <laughs> and so to be able to spend time together in person just has like an incredible effect on things um, in terms of, 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 of yeah creating that solidarity so yeah residencies fellowships mentorships really that those ways for people to to come together um, I think, are really, uh, really important. And yeah, you've been doing really well in that. And then the last thing I suddenly just thought of um, is, yeah, oh yeah, in terms of, in terms of advocacy, like you're actually ideally located because you know so many people in the field, you have such good, healthy relationships with, with uh, the stakeholders, but then also that strong relationship with cultural policy um, and that network. So yeah, I think that's definitely something that can be uh, further developed in that sense. Thanks, thank you. But you're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think just, just one comment about the mobility first, because we, as you know, we, we had to discontinue that program last year, unfortunately. But the thing is that we are actually shifting uh, also voluntarily that kind of support to more residency programs because okay again with the pandemic there was really a need to connect people virtually because it started as a virtual residency but we are also now it's the fifth one that we've run and we also really realize that it's so powerful to bring people together and it's amazing how even if they don't meet physically but just online 
there's been amazing exchanges. I think uh, Kamini would be able to tell you more about that because she was in the last one we did. But yeah, something to to really continue to develop. So perhaps not necessarily in terms of uh, mobility grants, but in terms of capacity building uh, for the sector and also for younger people, for people who are coming into the cultural field uh, as well, who maybe are not yet uh, sure of what they want to do or how they want to do it. It's something that um, might be useful to continue doing for them as well. Um, can I ask Johan for his... Uh... Yes, yes. It's going to be very much in, in line with what Yasmin <laughs> just just said i mean of course we want mobility and not just the digital one i mean I know. Also I know. the in-person one um what i think is um asf has been very good in in creating frameworks um and in maintaining uh, cultural relations even in difficult times but also has the potential to renew and to support new forms of cultural exchanges what i what i say is asf has um as um able to open doors uh, what we see a lot is that there is a strong demand from non-state stakeholders to be closely associated to the design or the co-design of forward-looking policies um, and to be able to continue to inform decision makers on all these you know highly relevant issues green transition diversity inclusion etc so uh, ASEF could really play a role in this and um, uh, in being this intermediary and has all the legitimacy to actually create the frames for these exchanges. And also we're talking a lot about the cultural field, cultural practitioners, you know, artists, um, but I would like to involve more also all the officials, you know, the ASEF. Arts councils, officers, all the people working uh, in administration, public institution, because they are allies. We are part of the same boat. You know, we are navigating in the same on the same waters. Um, so I think I can see ASAP really conveying regularly all these stakeholders to create spaces of exchange and to make sure that we support each other. Uh, because we are, again, part of the same ecosystem and to make sure that these in-person exchanges can really have a, both a context-based approach, approach, but also to make sure that we build um, valuable, rich uh, artistic, social, economic, uh, human relations. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. <laughs> Who I, did I meet? Oh, maybe Cathy? Yes. So I'm a fan. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think uh, it's, as I said, it's, it's quite unique in, in how it's kind of public and private. It's kind of regional. It's, um, you know, it, it branches, you know, it kind of bridges these two powers. Um, but I, I just wanted to maybe pick up uh, just to kind of, I think, going back to the round table and one of the things I think the second round table they talked about is of kind of being able to lead this collaborative process and that's what I think uh, Johan and also Jasmine was talking about which is to kind of <laughs> really there are few organizations that I can think, think of that can actually bring the kinds of partners that are from different geopolitical kind of spaces but also from you know kind of really small avant-garde indie arts practitioners as well as you know kind of getting the heads of national arts councils together uh, so you know that kind of enabling policymakers to to listen to what artists have to say and also <laughs> making artists listen to what policymakers have to say because I think it is it is a really two-way street so I think it's a you know and I'm glad that that was one of the things that came up in the roundtable because I think it's a really important function I, I'm a you know I really see the value of culture 360 I think that the work that it does is really in you know it, it it's maybe maybe underappreciated because I know running a website how much of work goes into that into kind of gathering information um, I think it would be great if you know there was it was in a different language it was not only in in for example in English I think that is a real it's a real issue because I am you know speaking from within the region language is so cleaved to class and economic access that um, we can say that we're diverse because you know you've got so many different artists from Southeast Asia, for example, or Asia involved. But is it, you know, is it in terms of class? Is it diverse in terms of class? So I think that maybe is something that I would like to see. 
Um, and I think also coming back to that is this idea of the, you know, kind of decolonizing the flow of, of information. I think there's been a lot of changes in cultural relations over the past 30 years, but it does still, I mean, I still come up, you know, to this kind of sense of um, programs that are, that are designed, even if it's not explicit, the programs very much are about, you know, bringing kind of senior artists from, from a kind of North or advanced economy. And it's not always Asia Europe, it can be Asia Asia, but, you know, artists from countries that have got a lot of money and therefore are funding the programs and dictate the terms of the program. Uh, so I, I don't know if, you know, one of the things, if, if I think about what role ASAP can play, I think about it as being an organization that might be able to be, you know, agnostic about this, about where your funding comes from, whether it's from a, you know, it's from a rich European or a rich Asian uh, government, uh, you know, but can, you know, is there a way that programming is designed regardless of where the money comes from, but it's, you know, it is, it is from a pool that has a collective desire to bridge the gap. Yeah, thank, thanks, Cathy. Yeah, I think, I think the, the reason why ASF is, uh, is an interesting organization is because we actually really are doing that in the sense that all these governments that are sort of, uh, uh, finding as if the good uh, intermediary between the government level and civil society and playing that role, they actually really fund with the idea that that funding is going into as if and not going into one activity or another. So that is the great, I think, uh, great value of this kind of project that we do because they are in a way uh, funded by all this government, but also supported you know, jointly by all these governments without saying, oh, because one has given more, the other one has given less. So that, in general, it's what's happening, which is good. But of course, there's always some complexities and that, I mean, it's part of the work that we do. But I agree with you also in terms of the language barrier. That's something, for example, that we've heard so many times and that we want to really act on because we have, it's not even a question for us in, in terms of what Culture 360 content, for example, propose. It's not even a question of looking at, uh, you know, like people who maybe are from different uh, work class or different uh, type of society. It's really, we are not really reaching to all of our member countries also, because some countries don't use English, don't use the same social media, don't have the same communication system. So we know, we are aware that we are actually losing out on a lot of opportunities and access to information on arts and culture for certain countries that uh, that we work on. So that's a valuable uh, point as well. So I hope that we can address that <laughs> in some way or another. Um, maybe Kamini, you wanted to add a few points as well from your side, from your experience working with us, but also in more broadly in terms of organization that operate uh, like ours, I would say. Yep, thanks, Valentina. Um, yes, I've worked on the virtual residencies and, you know, being a mentor and someone who, who was able to make a difference last year. I do um, echo what Yasmin has mentioned about fellowships, virtual and hybrid and physical and in-person mentorships. But there's something that I was thinking about. You mentioned it's 25 years, right? Yeah. So if you look at it as... Um, a following of people that have been with you for the last 25 years. Where are, where are all these people now? What stages are they at? Where are all these organizations, these cultural and arts practitioners? So even if they started at ground zero, they are 25 years later somewhere now doing something. So what I personally feel as a practitioner that's lacking, and you kind of opened up the opportunity for me to share my wish list with you, is leadership. Right? So leadership is what will really foster cultural diplomacy and specific leadership programs catered for us and culture that leads into all the topics that we've just shared, all the six of us today. That will be something to look into and that will be something that would take you into the, the next cycle of the next 25 years. Because to make a difference, you need the right leaders in arts and culture. So that will be the wish list that I put down here. Thanks, Benny. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just looking at time and I realized that uh, it was so interesting to be part of this conversation. Personally, I wasn't really paying attention. I should have. Uh, so maybe I would just uh, take a few extra minutes to uh, maybe give space to some of the people who are taking part in the conversation to ask questions. And I have a question with uh, some interesting comments from uh, Maria Kodbitska, who is from uh, working in Spain. And and she's asking, I'm very interested in the expert's opinion on the combination of cultural diplomacy and cultural relations. Unfortunately, the world is very turbulent right now, regardless of regions. I want to ask you a very practical question about the approach to this idea. I realize that it's a complicated question, but I have already experienced in practice how this combination works. Do you think there is a need for a certain limit beyond which art and culture can be an instrument of politics and influence? Should there be a certain responsibility to keep this relationship healthy? And then even if we are talking about language, it can also become an instrument of political influence through culture. So it's a, it's a lot of questions. It's not only one, <laughs> but it's quite uh, comprehensive, I would say, of all the things that we discuss. I don't know if there's anyone in the group who maybe wants to try and answer this very uh, detailed and complex topic. Just because I mentioned it at the beginning. Yes. But, um, yes. I mean, just because we work for a political organization, all artwork that goes into our programs is by definition political. And if it's, even if it's trying not to be political, it, it, that, that is a statement in itself. And I think, uh, I mean, we, uh, uh, there was a time in ASEAN's history when this idea of cultural diplomacy was, uh, was basically poo-pooed so much that it, ca it completely, uh, uh, it, it became inert. It wasn't able to, to do any programs because the, uh, the regional uh, cultural community decided that ASEAN kind of diluted everything to a, a base level and it wasn't, well, it, they had no artistic value anymore. I mean, it, it. I think we're in a different time now. I think there's a bit, I mean, I think the reason why we have these definitions between cultural diplomacy and cultural relations is because of, because of uh, the history of, of how cultural diplomacy uh, has been realized. It's, it's very loaded, <laughs> especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, I mean, you know, the immediate thing that comes to mind is CIA. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I think about cultural diplomacy in the, in the, during the Cold War. So uh, I think we're in a different time now. I mean, governments, most governments know that if they do these types of programs and, they, and they're too heavy-handed on the, the political side, they won't work. The, 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 the intention is then, then completely decimated. I mean, by and large, uh, these are soft power initiatives. It's uh, It's... You know, it's government showing that they have a sophistication, that they understand how the industry works. So they want to be involved. But by and large, I'll say by and large, that they want to be in, involved in these programs and they want like these conversations to happen and for things to kind of develop naturally and for them to continue to sustain and to go on. Uh, uh, I mean, every now and then you get a different type of program which comes up, uh, which of course still happens, but and, you know that that may depend on the nation. So. I mean, I'm not entirely sure if that answers the question that was asked, but I can say I can say from personal experience, I think cultural diplomacy means something different for people who practitioner it now, and I think that there is a better understanding with people who are uh, who are in this space from all sides, from government to diplomats to you know people working in the arts and artists. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think uh, things have luckily changed and evolved quite a bit uh, in terms of what we mean by cultural diplomacy, but also yeah, of the actors that are involved, of the people that are actually working more together in this sense and not just government-led initiatives that, as you said, then uh, don't don't really work if they are sort of imposed in a way or in another. Uh, there's another question, and I think I will have to take only one because we are really uh, short on time. Uh, someone is asking, I'm interested in any examples of how the demonstration of best practice 
and the ability to revise and review issues by artists and micro organization like grassroots can influence government policy to empower the cultural sector. So I don't know if this is a question, I don't know, maybe Jasmine or someone working more uh, at grassroots level, if you have any, uh, any, I don't know, I'm just thinking anyone wants to answer to take this question. It's basically how we can influence government from really like very grassroots level. And that I think, sorry, just one thing, this is probably where organization that can in, be intermediary play also a role to bring those ideas from the grassroots level to governments. Yes, Jasmine. I actually think you already raised his hand. Sorry, who? You already raised his hand, I think. So I, I would be happy to pass a question to him. Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't see. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, so, so, thank you very much for these. Actually, I had raised my hand with for the previous. Sorry, I don't voice, know. Okay. But I'm, I'm happy, I don't know. Um, maybe I'll, I'll give the floor to Yasmin for this one. And if there's time, I can I can. Yes, add please. Something well, later. maybe the, uh, both of you, if you want to comment on this, thank you. All right. Um, okay. So look, look at about this this final this final question on the ability uh, and let's say in the work that can be done uh, from the ground. Um, I mean, I think I think uh, let's say there's different examples probably of like particularly federations and umbrella organizations of uh, small grassroots organizations joining forces to lobby for policy change. Um, one example that comes to mind, um, and it's, let's say it's, it's not exclusively the work of grassroots organizations, but um, I'm actually taking part in a, in a research report with on the move uh, in the context of a, of a European project called Europe Beyond Access, which is for the accessibility of uh, disabled artists and disabled audiences um, uh, in, in the performing arts in particular. And some of the changes that we are observing uh, in terms of making uh, cultural policies more aware of the realities of disabled artists and disabled uh, audiences in countries like Italy, Poland, or Sweden, they've been driven by uh, grassroots organizations and groups of uh, disabled artists, for instance. So, I mean, this is like one example that comes to mind now. Sorry, I muted myself. Yes, Jasmine, thanks, Jordi. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about it because actually a lot of the organizations that are part of the alliance are, you know, are very, obviously very grassroots and um, very political, but also a lot of them are quite activist. Um, obviously with an, with an intent to, to change things and to have their voices heard, um, but that, that can also be a complicated um, position, let's say, because not everyone is in a safe environment or in a, in a safe country to actually do protest. Um, so that's always quite interesting to, to understand from these partners, like really on that level, like what are their, what are their fears, what are their concerns and, my experience is that with this, it's really interesting to really be truly global um, because then when there is a problem in one country and, you know, there has been a protest or there's been like even, even uh, law, lawsuits, how then we can connect with like pro bono environmental lawyers in, in other countries. So, I think from, from my personal experience, it's not, yeah, it's very much in, 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 on the level of, of grassroots kind of activism and how do you translate those messages that are very urgent um, and yeah, very complicated, let's say, um, into, into also language, into yeah, a way of communicating that is that is usable for for other institutions, and I think to go to go international is uh, is a really is a really useful way for that. So really, the the institutions or the the councils that are, that work uh, 
uh, inter intercontinental, let's say. Uh, but then, yeah, it depends on what kind of example, um, yeah, what kind of solutions or she's, she's the, the question is looking for. But this is from my personal experience. Thanks. I think we, we are coming to a close. I already almost 10 minutes more. I don't know if there's anyone else who wants to say anything before we wrap up this session. So, okay, all good. I saw some other questions and comments and I thank you everyone who attended for those questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to address them, but I personally think this was one of the most interesting conversations I've been part of. So I hope that everyone enjoyed it in the same way I did. A lot of things were discussed, a lot of uh, very interesting points uh, were touched upon. And I think from the point of view of Azef, we will really uh, cherish all of this information and and come up with the final uh, document which will sort of summarize this but we'll also try to uh, bring in those ideas in the way we work and in the partnerships that we build uh, with the idea that uh, I think the most important thing is that we develop uh, human connections and we continue to do that even though we come from uh, maybe very different uh, experiences and very different countries so uh, with all the speakers tonight thank you so much for joining me and to all the audience out there thank you so much for attending uh, please stay in touch with us uh, look at our newsletter we have a lot of new things coming up some of them already answering some of the points that were brought into this discussion i won't reveal anything but hopefully this year we'll come up with some new ideas and uh, work together towards better cultural relations between asia and europe thanks so much for your time and good night everyone